2006 to 2009, I was project officer at Yaba, the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. Right now, since 2012, I work at the Senegal National Sanitation Utility, leading the gate funding project on faculty large management situation. This session of this afternoon focus on fetal sludge treatment using physical, chemical methods using flying guide and also using wetlands. This topic is very important because we realize that in developing countries we propose a lot of technology, but the conventional techniques previously implemented in developing countries no longer works. In terms of performance, accurate performance, in terms of footprint, in terms of reuse, we realize that we have not. And the presentation is that for maybe we'll answer or we'll offer some answer of this particular question. Each presenter will present in 15 minutes because we have the chance, we have just for free presentation. We have time to present during 15 minutes. And after each presentation, we will give the floor to the participant in order to ask who to bring three clarifying questions. And when we finish all the presentation, we will organize a sort of panel. We will have all the presentation for answer of important participants and we will discuss in depth about the free presentation. I will be very happy to welcome Dr. Atitaya, the former inmate from Yapa. Dr. Atitaya is a senior research specialist at the Asian Institute of Technology and he specializes on decentralized web support treatment systems and technical research. What Atitaya is presenting today, a study uh, focus on the effect of different filter media on nitrogen transformation in the vertical flow contract of wetland. Thank you very much, Barry. Okay, we'll talk to my presenter now. Uh, Dr. Transformation in East Media Layer of Vertical Flow Contract at the Grand Chief is because last. For this slide, I just would like to share with you about the situation of because last management in Thailand. But then on our field survey, we found that uh, uh, the capacity of treatments in Thailand only 40% that can receive of the because of generated in our country. But however, 90% uh, of that 40% still improper operate or even cannot operate well. Then it meant mean that like 98% of people slash in our country also go to the Ipilan area and also go to the receiving water. Then, as a researcher, we also try to manage with the slash. And this is just the idea of the researcher that try to close the loop. So yeah, we try to cheat and also we try to reuse. And for my pieces, I just focusing on the last part of the chain which is treatment uh, and reuse. Then, when then on our experience, like 15 years AIT, we already confirmed that vertical flow constructor design had the high efficiency or promising treatment efficiency for because of treatment. And, and for my presentation, if we know about the next gen transformation of the system, inside the system, it will be good and also it can help for the size of the system, whether you would like to increase the treatment efficiency or if you would like to reuse the nitrogen, we also can model if we know well within the system. Then, for my study, we already know that nitrogen nitrification and also denitrification occur in the system of each layer, such as in sand layer or gravel layer. But for this study, we would like to go in depth to identify the DO concentration or oxygen uh, fluctuation according to the time of the operation inside the system gain. 
And this one show you the employment cost setup that we have at AIT by uh, we use the plastic tanks one one meter by one meter and about 60, 60 centimeter of the meter. And inside the system, we also put put the pole here in the term of measure DO concentration pH and ORP to know the fluctuations of the DO inside like a real time monitoring after we feed and also from, from the east layer we also uh, measure the pole place that just cut through sand, small gravel and also large gravel in the bottom part to see the fluctuation of the each parameter
the only is to zero this is represent an LB condition and then from the middle uh, layer of the media we see uh, small gravel and also large gravel which is present here uh, before feed with the pickle slash or uh, at the starting state as gravel still have a uh, slightly LB content condition which is about one milligram per litre of EO uh, still appear in the system and then after six hours seems like the rate of that fat layer go down to the middle part which is the EO concentration can go up a bit to 1.7 milligram per litre and then after one day the EO also drop down to nearly zero or anabolic conditions and then the current part which is large gravel before feed also just have slightly new concentration or anaerobic condition just 0.3 milligram per litre of EO and then after 6 hours of feeding seems like percolates from the uh, top part from the or also bottom part then the concentration can go up a bit to just 1 milligram per litre and then after one day also can list the anaerobic condition and then this is also uh, just uh, show you the transformation in sand layer. Uh, sorry that it is quite long with the typing, but uh, about 60% of organic can remove in the top of parts and also sand layer, <coughs> and also just 3% of near can, can remove on this part. And the other things, the nitrates and nitrates also increasing in the sand layer. And then we, if we compare the occurring of the nitrites and nitrates in that layer together with the DO concentration, we found that it's still not quite balanced because actually from my hypothesis at the first time, I thought like uh, if we know DO concentration, then it may balance with the occurring of nitrites and nitrates in the system. But after we measure, sorry, we found that uh, the occurring of nitrites and nitrates in the system still higher than the concentration that we can measure in the system about two to three times. That is mean that uh, oxygen in the system uh, may come from the other source, like uh, from the pan root and also can transfer from the air. Maybe this one maybe can be the further study. And then for small carbon layer also more less the same uh, but not much reaction as that layer then just 7% of organic removed in this uh, level and also 10% of organic also removed in and the occurring of state and next state also removed here under uh, the identification reaction also for the metal parts, gravel layer, the remaining of every form also removed here. Then I would like to come to the conclusion. Uh, for the upper part, uh, ammonia can transform by identification under, uh, uh, sorry, uh, under aerobic condition, which is we can confirm the DO concentration in the system because with uh, on my previous study, at that time I not measure the old concentration yet, but uh, for my study I also got question a lot how can identification occur in the media or inside the, the sense media. And I, I also measure the old concentration to confirm the reaction rate. And also, within that layer itself, the identification also can occur because and we also can confirm by the uh, anaerobic conditions. And then at the bottom part, uh, sorry, uh, both the reaction also can occur that at the bottom part, nitrification and denitrification because the oxygen also can come with the component that go down to from the the because slash and also from the sand filter layer and then go down to the bottom part and then the remaining of the oxygen can also can slightly occur identification and continue with identification according to the uh, uh, 
of operating a car which is about five to six days. Okay, then that's all for my presentation. But it's like is that uh, the recommendation as I suggest. Uh, right now we already know the the uh, the open condition of oxygen within the pumpkin, and also we know the building number which is how much oxygen used, and also the identification. But still, we still cannot clarify with the oxygen transformation from the air to the system, and also uh, the of oxygen in the biofilm cell in the air cell, and so last one also oxygen transformation from the plant food. This is me.
uh, this system. Uh, we characterized the, the solarity and we implemented eight pilot scale experimental units. Uh, about the setup of, of the experimental unit, we selected two different species of plants. The first one is called Scarca, it's a, a local species of Rambitis. And the second one is called Napier Bajra hybrid grass. It was developed by, by the local university in, in India. It, the main use of, of these plants, the second, is uh, for, for feeding the animals, the cows. Um, this is how it looks, the experimental unit. Uh, as it was mentioned in, in, our, in previous experiments, we also included the aeration pipes because uh, in the literature it's mentioned it, it improves the performance. Also, we used four different layers of sand and gravel, and uh, we used the six plants per, per square meter, the density of plants. Uh, the operation, uh, we had to dilute because the concentration of total solids was very high on this product. Uh, with, it, it was built eight, eight experimental units and the feeding and resting period was one week. Uh, about the sampling, we sampled two different products in the treatment wetland. At the top layer we have the dry sludge. Uh, here is how it looks at the time of sampling. And at the bottom, we sampled the, the water leachate. As you can see, even looking just the different, the difference in colors, we applied four different loading rates: uh, 40, 80, 120, and 160 kilograms of TS per square meter per year. And this is the influent, and this is at different loading rates the the quality of uh, the samples of each experimental unit. Uh, about the results, the characteristics of uh, the sludge, uh, that, that was the average of temperature, 23, almost 24 uh, degrees, and the TSS was uh, almost 12%, pH range between 6.8 to 7.3. The nutrients, it, it is good to mention that the concentration of nutrients is quite high, that's why this product is applied successfully in, in the agriculture. The, the local farmers know that, that the, this product is very good. And the organic matter, we, we measured the volatile solids, uh, it's, it's a little bit high. And the pathogen concentrations, also we, we measured salmonella and E. coli. Salmonella was absent and the E. coli is a little bit high. About the dry sludge, what are the characteristics of the dry sludge? Uh, we check the sludge dryness. As you can see, we have uh, the results for, for four different loading rates. And uh, there is a tendency of a, a, a linear increase. But there is a, a recommendation for, the, for reuse in the final product. The, the dry sludge uh, should be around 35% of uh, moisture content. This is an indicator to say, okay, this is the recommended factor. We can assume that at least 100 kilograms of TS per square meter per year is the recommended uh, loading rate. And also, we check the stabilization. You can see the influence, it was around almost 70%, it was reduced at different loading rates. At low loading rates, of course, there are more, more reduction, more stabilization of the product. Uh, about the nutrients, this is the, the quality, the, the amount of different the components of nitrogen, and this is a, a different uh, loading rates what we found in the experimental units. Uh, these values are similar uh, other materials like compost published in, in uh, papers, in scientific papers. Uh, about the E. coli, uh, this morning was mentioned that it's not a very effective uh, method for E. coli production. That's true. We have the, uh, two, cl two classifications for reuse. Uh, 
the class A, which means if we, we are below the class A, we can reuse the product without any measure of any health problem. But also, if we are below class B, we can reuse the product. We reach these values, but taking some measurements in order to handle with, with using the safe tools and materials. Uh, about the water, the water that was collected in the bottom, uh, it's very important to measure the quantity of water. Why? Because there is this factor, the evapotranspiration. That's why the dry bed or sludge treatment wetland can change. Uh, it's not the same design for everywhere. It depends a lot of the local conditions. In this case, for example, the evapotranspiration is almost 12 millimeters per day. And if we work with very low growing rates, we, we will see that the plants will start dying because they don't have enough water to, to, to grow and to develop all the activities. But this is also, we need at least 110 uh, kilograms TSS uh, for square meter per year to, to have enough water for the plants to do their job. Um, about the quality, these are four different loading rates, the parameters, and these are the guidelines uh, recommended for, for, for the US EAP, e, EPA. And uh, you can see most of the parameters are below under uh, or under the regulation. That means the water can be reused, at least in this case, the water that we collected can be reused for irrigation. One interesting parameter here is the sodium absorption rate, which is here. Uh, this is, uh, in almost all the cases, we, we found the, uh, the below of the recommendations in the guidelines. Well, uh, just to conclude, what we have, we have this uh, toilet leak biogas plant. It's a successful uh, system implemented in, in India. It's fitted with the cow dung and the toilet daily. And it, it generates enough biogas for cooking every day. Also generates a slurry, which is different, which is a very well appreciated uh, product for reuse in agriculture. Uh, we found that applying this technology Slash street and wetland or planted dry beds, it's just a question of uh, nomenclature, I think. Uh, we, we have two products the dry sludge accumulated in the top layer and the, the leachate, which is collected in the bottom. Both of these products can be applied in agriculture. Uh, they, they do that. And, um, also, additionally, the plants, because we tested different plants and we can test, uh, I think, a, a lot of varieties of plants. In this case, one of the species was uh, especially developed for feeding cow. Uh, also, it's, it's possible to reuse it. Somehow, we can close the cycle uh, applying this technology. Uh, well, I want to acknowledge uh, the different institutions which were involved in this research, UNESCO IHG, Universidad del Valle from Cali, Colombia, Bill and Melinda Gates, Finnish, the local Indian organization, and Waste, the Netherlands organization based in Netherlands. Thank you very much. This is a picture of how it, the system, how it looks. After we finished, we, we also were able to transmit the people how it's important and they started applying you can see after the system it's not like a very well designed or very well structured but it was applied and they are they are using the system thank you very much Salmonella concentration because we didn't want salmonella. Oh, 
E. coli. If we use the E. coli as an indicator of pathogens. But the E. coli was still in the B. right, so you didn't reduce it. Yeah, we did we reduced, but let's say we were uh, uh, looking to reduce, to classify as like class A, which is a product you can handle without any safe measurements, health problems, but we couldn't reach that, uh, that class A. That class B is also possible to reduce, but you have to take care about how to handle the product. We reach that if, if that's the results. You were already in class B when you started. Yep. Okay. Hi. Thanks, Grover. Um, two questions. First of all, why did you choose that configuration of gravel? And did you try with different configurations during the experiment? And secondly, can you comment upon the quantity of biogas that was produced and, for example, how much cooking time it gave the users? Thank you. Okay. Uh, about the configuration, um, I'll try to find the slide. But uh, it's a general recommendation of designing the, these systems. I added one extra layer. Usually, we just use three layers. In most of the most of the experimental units, we just use usually recommend the three layers of, of, of gravel, fine gravel, and sand between 10 to 15 centimeters. That's the most used range. Why we apply four layers? First of all, uh, there was uh, the material was available. Well, that was one of the reasons. And the second, uh, it was. To, to test, uh, well, at least to compare with the existing design if it has a, a difference. But uh, it was not the focus of the, the, the research, but it was additional, let's say, additional finding that there, there is not that much difference. And regarding to the biogas production, uh, we didn't measure because it was not part of the research. But what we are doing, we are having right now a, a, another research project in India, in this, the same place, to, to compare uh, an aerobic digestion system without toilet and with toilet. And uh, we, we don't have the final report, but I can comment that there is a more methane production uh, using the toilet leak biogas plant. This is a, a project with, which is still going on. Uh, we don't have the final results, so what we have, hopefully we, we can share it. But regarding to this system, how much energy, we, we didn't measure the, the production of biogas, but what we measure is, for example, how, if it's enough energy for cooking, they have, uh, because they, they maintain very well the system, they, because they need the energy for cooking, and they have a, enough energy for, for cooking a meal every day for a family for four to five people. That was the range. You can take advantage of the small number of the hunters to take two more pressure from the other side. Thank you for your nice presentation. My question is, uh, Usually wetlands subsurface like this vertical or horizontal, they are cloaked. Do you know about how long this will run? About clogging. Clogging. Yep. Well, it's also not part of the research, but like what I can share about clogging. For example, uh, in Europe they use this technology for, for very long periods. One one interesting parameter of this is the accumulation rate of dry sludge in the top layer more or less is like 10 centimeters, 10 to 15 centimeters per year. Then that's why this system is very, very, very applicable. And there are a lot of uh, natural processes, let's say, like uh, the plants which are growing, they are moving, they crack the sludge. There are oxygen transfer uh, from the leaves to, to the roots. There are a lot of natural processes that happen in this system which helps to, to treat the product. 
and uh, there are cases in, in Europe, European countries, where they, they use they empty every ten years. For example, they accumulate like one one uh, meter of uh, dried sludge in the top layer. But uh, it's it's very interesting. But for this small case, uh, let's say a household level scale, they what they need, they because they are harvesting uh, two times per year or three times per year. They, they don't need the fecal sludge uh, or the treated product every day. Then we can we can decide a, a wetland which you accumulate. Let's say you you have your ending period could be six months, could be four months or one year. And uh, another important uh, parameter that we we check the the plants grow almost to one meter uh, in one month. And then they can harvest every month the plants they can feed with this. And there, we can play a lot with this part, a lot with the parameters. But that's uh, a very good advantage of this technology. No well, it was not, there is no no information about cloning. Last question. Okay, thank you for your excellent presentation. I would like to know, Alok, what is the CSU in print? And the second one is the what is the proportion of mixing? Can you verify that? Mixing what? Uh, mixing with that was um, that uh, toilet and the chicken and the bee or virus. What is the problem with that? Why do we leak? No. You are yeah. asking why. No. Yeah, I tried to explain at the beginning. Uh, because the system, the anaerobic digestion system without toilet is already 20 years old and it's still working in this area. And uh, recently, because all these areas, they practice open dedication, they don't have toilet, and the government and different institutions are building toilets, what's the next problem? How do we manage the fecal starch collected in the toilets? That's why one solution would be linked to this existing system, and we evaluated that. Okay, so, so I asked, what did you see in this room? Uh, so yeah, yeah, on the yeah, minus. What is the C in this year? Can't do my in this year. Because of that, you have a good question. What I propose is answer as a panel. Okay. But what do I propose in this Thank you. Um, with a treatment capacity um, of around 1,500 cubic a day, 
but much more uh, remains, remains untreated. In Kampala, there was a, a treatment plant which started operating um, early in the middle of uh, last year, and it was shortly after um, it started operating, it was, it was overloaded, and um, there's a, a much uh, larger need to uh, extend these treatment capacities. Um, both treatment plans rely on um, sand drying beds to treat the fecal sludge. As you know, fecal sludge is mostly water, so one of the, the main steps when treating fecal sludge is separating um, liquids and solids. Um, drying beds are commonly used all over the world. They have advantages of low operational costs, low capital costs. Um, they, they benefit from the semi-arid climate in, in sub-Saharan Africa, but the big disadvantage is they, they need large drying spaces. So what we are looking at is, is waste, how we can increase the, these drying, the drying footprint. And as you can already see it on the top right picture in Kampala, treatment plants are now tended to get located outside of the city, which is a good idea in a way, but when we're considering that uh, we're mostly transporting uh, water around the city, it then increases um, fecal sludge collection transport costs, um, so which then at the end go get passed on to the household level. So what we're looking at is um, something which um, is there waste water engineers around here. I'm kind of um, a waste water engineer trained uh, in Germany. Poly electrolytes and organic polymers, metal salts are used in wastewater treatment to increase uh, dewatering properties of sludge. So sludge particles are usually negatively charged, and by adding these materials, mixing them with the sludge, um, this, this negative charge get overcome and bigger flock particles build up, which are easier, easier to rewater. So that's what you, what you see here on the right, this column, which is uh, untreated, unconditioned fecal sludge, and then when you treat it, when you condition it with, um, for example, these polyelectrolytes or metal salts, um, they're building larger flocks, which affect settling, and also dewatering. And I'm gonna today focus on dewatering, how um, conditioning can reduce treatment footprints by increasing the dewatering properties of sludge. These conditions are nice, but experience show that um, using imported expensive consumables for fecal sludge treatment are one reason why fecal sludge treatment plants in Sub-Saharan Africa, also in other countries, are not sustainably working. There's a paper I recommend um, from my colleague Magali Bassan on success and failure assessment um, on fecal sludge treatment technologies. Um, we should learn more about why treatment technologies are working and why they're not working. So as part of this study, we were looking in using commercial conditioners, so um, conditions which are available in Europe, the United States. I believe also in Asia, conditions are, um, are produced, and we were comparing them with um, conditions which are locally available in Dakar, and potentially also locally available in other um, low-income countries or other areas of the world. I think we shouldn't not always talk only about low-income areas, they can also have implications for, for other regions. So these are the ones we were, uh, were looking at, um, Kaidosan, Moringa Oifera, Diatropa Cocos, Calotropis Drusera, and, and Lime. I think I don't have to say much about Lime. Um, Ketosan is produced from ketin, which is the part of everyone's hair, and nails, and is commonly uh, produced from a shell of, of shrimps. So all areas around the world, big cities, um, which are located next to the, the sea, um, have the potential that there is um, production of these, these, uh, this fish waste, which can produce the chylosan. Moringa oleifera um, is at the moment a bit of a hyped plant. Uh, in Europe, you get it now as a tea, it's also produced as an oil. In, in Senegal, it's also a popular food, and the leaves of the moringa um, oleifera seeds are eaten. So these were the, the local conditions we were looking at. To assess if these conditions can really improve the eroding properties, we're conducting lab and bench scale experiments. And in the laboratory, we're looking at a specific filtration, which is measuring kind of the resistance, how difficult is it to dewater, uh, to get water out of the sludge, which is uh, done by, by adding um, conditioned sludge into this funnel and then sucked through the filter. So we're comparing unconditioned sludge, conditioned sludge, and also different dosages. And as, as you know, drying beds are not um, driven by, by a vacuum pump, they're driven by gravity. 
So obviously these um, lab scale results only have limited application for full scale treatment. Therefore, we're com comparing our lab scale results with bench scale experiments, constructing these dewatering columns which are shown on the right. So I want to now dive into um, the results. These are the results of the lab scale experiments. And um, first of all, the, the first two columns compare um, dewatering of unconditioned fecal sludge with uh, wastewater and drinking water sludge from the literature. So the higher the specific filtration, the lower is the dewatering property. And as you can already see, it's very difficult, or it's diff more difficult to dewater fecal sludge in comparison to wastewater sludge. Column number three to seven shows um, the different um, conditions. So we are looking at number one, unconditioned fecal sludge, and three to seven. And we see that, except for Eotropococcus seeds and Colotropis leaves, um, conditioning increased the dewatering properties. This seems to be clear for Moringa Refeta, column number three, for lime, and for commercial conditioners, and this variability is a bit higher for ketosan, but remember we did it at different dosages, so the higher, the higher end of ketosan means there are lower dosages, whereas the lower end means you have a higher dosage. When we were looking at comparing these results to our batch scale experiments, we saw that results were in general 4 to 30 percent lower, which um, has different reasons. One is, for example, that we didn't use a vacuum, other ones is that batch scale experiments obviously um, control conditions, they should always be treated with care. This here shows um, a dewatering curve. Um, so how long did it take to dewater uh, the, the, the percolate free water? The black um, filled circles show unconditioned sludge. And as you can see, the dewatering was faster when the sludge was conditioned with, in this case, lime ketosan compared also to these commercial conditions. And as you can also see is that um, lime and ketosan compare well with commercial conditions. So saying that you could use commercial conditions, they, they're also effective in increasing dewatering properties. So now you, you'll ask me, so what does it really bring? I'm operating a treatment plant or designing a system. And um, here you can see how much, how much percentage faster was percolation um, of unconditioned sludge uh, compared to conditioned sludge. And as you can see, it was between 60% below and for ketosan to up to 99% for a uh, commercial conditioner, which is C2, uh, 2064. And this is then the time you can subtract or which you can reduce your, your treatment um, time and reduce your treatment capacity, and increase your treatment capacity or reduce the footprint of uh, newly constructed um, bags. In Dhaka, depending on the loading rate, the time it takes to dewater sludge on drying beds usually between two to nine days. So this time you can cut by um, by 60 or or more percent. But I think also this also has implications for other, um, not only drying beds, also for mechanical dewatering or for for container-based solutions. So we're not only looking into into drying beds. Now we, we didn't find the, the solution for fecal sludge treatment in, in this study. All the conditioners have advantages and disadvantages. I had big discussions with them why before I started the study, because he was saying you don't even have to look at Moringa oleifera because it's not going to be available with these seeds. And he was right. So listen to your supervisor sometimes also. So as you can see on, on the top one is the different um, dosages required for conditioning, so around 4 kg for per ton um, total solids for ketosan and 625 for Moringa oleifera. And these quantities for at least a centralized um, fecal sludge treatment in urban areas, so talking from like, let's say above 3 400 cubics a day, this is not available at the moment. If there can be a demand be created, maybe it's, it's, it could be available in the future, but it's not available now. This was different for ketosan. Um, in Dhaka, we did a market demand study or demand a supply study of these um, shrimp shells, and um, th there's enough shrimp shells available, um, which are not used at the moment, where ketosan could be processed out. So if owners would say, okay, we're now um, using ketosan our treatment processes, there could be a local, local company could coming up and process these this waste stream into into a conditioner. Uh, different points I also want to make here is that uh, 
quick line, and when we bring really got it here, I have to treat the sludge mass. So, I mean, you don't want to, at the end, treat more sludge than necessary to increase your costs. Um, for marine goliferia, you could argue that, okay, you're adding an organic material, so you're increasing maybe the properties of your treatment end product if you use it in agriculture. Um, but that's usually not the case for lime, which increases um, the ash content um, and might be uh, useful for some soils, but not, um, not for every. So it also has implications for, for resource recovery. Um, looking at all, comparing all the, the conditions that we um, we uh, assess that would recommend you looking into Kitusan. So if, if some, for some of you these results are interesting, I would also um, like to talk to you. This is a case study just also to talk about uh, costs. Obviously, a um, um, condition is also going to cost money. And that's just from the back of the envelope um, um, assessment of Cumbria Kikusa treatment plant, which is one of the treatment plants in, in Dakar. At the top you see, at the top of the table you see what would be the demand of conditioners. And as you can see here, what, what I've mentioned before, you would around, need around 10 kilograms per day of ketosan, where there's more than one and a half tons for Moringa olifera. And you can see that the commercial conditioners you would actually need um, bigger, bigger quantities. In terms of costs, the lowest you could get would be a 20% increase in operational costs. So it's significantly, but I think these numbers should be um, should be um, taken with care, um, as we don't really know so much. That's also what we heard um, yesterday. And today we don't know so much about real costs, treatment costs um, of fecal cell treatment plants. Um, I would like to thank our partners in Dakar for supporting the study, and especially students because these were the, the guys really making um, the, the research in Dakar. Thank you for your attention. Why did you choose to use the specific resistance? 
term filtration method. I find that a very complicated method and I intend to use this the capillary suction time method. CSD. We simply didn't have the, this, this device. Easy like, but why, why do you, why, what's the advantage of CSD? I mean, the advantage of CSD is that you have a machine and it gives you a number. It's, it's quick and it doesn't rely on filtration like Annie said. You're looking for dewatering by gravity and CST tends to use gravity. I mean, I also found that in the literature, what was used most was uh, specific resistance to filtration. But I mean, I mean, clinicians doing, depending on how they work, they're doing both of it. They overcome surface charges and they bridge. So, which kind of treatment are you talking about? Yeah, typically, uh, we, we, we use both of coagulant and flocculant. I, I don't know much about ketosan, but I guess that is mostly uh, work as a flocculant. So, what do you think about coagulant? They, like, the, I mean, with the commercial products, you can really um, control how they work. It's conditional, it's flocculent, and these natural ones are somewhere in between. So they're conditional, they're flocculent, um, they, yeah. they're doing both. I mean, it also depends on where you get your shrimps from, how, how, uh, how far you process it. If you would produce it locally, um, you would maybe not um, produce it to a degree like a fine grade, um, so it, I think it's difficult to control which mechanisms we bring. Yeah, understand. Um, yeah, both function. Yeah, yeah, understand. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, I have a question. Uh, I think did you have a process for selecting the synthetic polymers before you started the testing for comparison? Because that's really important. There's a whole range of products, and in terms of the quantities that you add, you know, there was some comparison with ketosan, but if you only have the right polymer, what you add might be much, much lower, and it, um, which results in a much higher um, case solids. Another quick point I wanted to make is is when you choose different conditioners, um, it's also very important to look at not just the demonterability or the final case solids, but how much sludge you produce in total. And you had it in your slide, but what you had was how much conditioner you had. In addition to that, there's also um, generation of chemical sludge. So you can add something and that can result in chain reactions and that can produce much more sludge in terms of mass compared to what you add as a conditioner. Finally, one advantage of synthetic polymers, and maybe this is something that you can look at later, but they work very well in a wide pH range or different sludge characteristics and the, um, organic conditions or the biological ones, um, that's where they can suffer. Just some points. Yeah, um, thanks. Excellent question. And you can see that one can see that you're an expert. <laughs> because, um, no, you're right. Um, the selection of the commercial products is very difficult. If you call up one of these companies, they ask you, uh, so what sludge do you have? Is it industrial? Is it a mixture? What industries do you have in your catchment? Is it simply domestic? And they talk about wastewater sludge. Um, and I simply couldn't tell them a lot of, about sludge, the sludge I have. I could tell them it's septic tank sludge from Dakar. And if you call up a, a French company, or a Swiss company in this case, they can't really um, tell you what, um, what product you should use. Because conditioners are commonly used in wastewater treatment. 
So I would say it was fairly random how we to pick these um, conditioners. And yes, they were they're not the right conditioners for Fika search. They are conditioners which are uh, commonly used for um, um, mechanical dewatering. So um, they have they um, increase like they produce really high flocks. So they are more resistant to decanting and centrifugation and these kind of things. So you're right. Um, it could, could be that with other commercial conditioners, these the required dosage for commercial products is, is much lower. Um, pH, I would say it's not so much an issue for us because uh, Fika Search usually has a pH which is in the range that um, it, it's not an issue. I mean, that's usually around, around seven, um, six and a half, seven, seven and a half. But because you usually, I mean, you don't have any huge uh, influence of industry, industries or something, it's, it's not so much an issue. And there was a third question, um, which I didn't remember. What was the third point? Ah, quantity of sludge. Um, I mean, all the conditioners we tested don't produce a chemical sludge, which is difficult to dispose. Lime dust. You, you, you because, of the, because, because of the high pH. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's why I'm saying that, first of all, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend lime because it's, it, it adds a lot of ash, it adds a lot of inorganic material. Um, but it, depend, it depends on what you're going to do with your sludge. If you have acid soils and you, use it, you want to use it in agriculture or as a soil amendment, it just depends what your, your end use is. But I agree, yeah. Like, lime would be the one I would, I would definitely recommend. Yes, the last question from the moderator. Who wants? What about the open from? If we realize we use more it enhances the quantity of organic matter we have in the area. If you want to protect the rich, you realize how it actually be in the community science. Yeah, so that was not the focus of our research, but, um, but we kind of looked at it, and there's also I was a study before that yeah, with moringa at at dosages where you can have an impact on dewatering your your effluent in terms of nutrients and, and COD, COD is, is increasing. So you maybe have better dewatering properties, but at the end you uh, you have more treatment of the effluent. Okay, a big clap for this.